because I did promise Dan Mulhern that I would get it to him. Thank you. Sure. I think I would know this by now. I've been running these meetings for a while. Um, again, it's um, April 22nd, and this is the TDAC Tourism and Economic Development Advisory Committee meeting. So I need a motion to approve the minutes of February 25th. Laura, got a second? DJ, everybody good with that? All in favor? Yes. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Um, we started our one of, I guess, the February meeting with um, what I called around the room. And I know we've got some business to take care of, but found it was actually more effective, I think, to just go around the room and find out everything that everybody's got going on with their organizations and what's happening. I think a lot of it ties into uh, some of the work we're doing. So uh, maybe Karen, <clears throat> if, you mind, if I can just start with you up at Grace Farms, like what's happening up there? How's everything going? And, um, and we'll just proceed down the line. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, lots going on. Um, today, of course, is Earth Day, as we all know, and Mark Fowler, our Nature Initiative Director, did a bang up job with a huge um, virtual panel today. Um, talking about sort of nature, healing nature, and a bunch of virtual events online and crafts for kids. And so for any families who are looking for activities and, and birding and that kind of thing, it's all on the website. Um, Sharon continues to lead us in the Design for Freedom movement to eradicate slavery from the built environment. And we're looking at a few pilot projects, um, one of which is local and we're exploring whether um, any of these are feasible, but are but as you know, folks in town or you all are thinking about um, new builds, um, renovations, that kind of thing, we're really eager to partner with somebody to showcase what it could mean to take a small to big project and apply the principles of, of design for freedom, looking at materials, anything from steel to ceramic tile to fabrics, um, what could that look like? So she's really leading that effort and then of course, we're really thinking deeply about reopening. Um, the reopening will be at the end of August, beginning of September, and thinking about how do we welcome back our community? How do we get the place and the team ready for that um, in safe ways and, and looking to launch um, extensive um, in-person programming and also um, experiences where people can explore the property about what we've been doing over this past year while closed, um, but also just sort of new opportunities to re-engage the public um, in the building. So that's that's what we're up to. We're, we're in a fun, a fun moment and trying to really leverage this time while we remain closed to the public um, to continue serving food to our 11 non-for-profit partners and um, building that out even as we reopen that will be a movement that will continue. We're looking to figure oh. out how we how we staff that so that um, you know the, the food needs will not go away. Um, you know we're watching um, the numbers of at food banks. Um, they're just not waning. So Grace Farms is in that for the long haul. It's great. Um, <clears throat> some of you might have heard that the governor made an announcement on uh, I guess Monday um, that surprised everybody a little bit. Uh, uh, we seemed a bit early, but uh, that he plans on rescinding, if all goes well, are expiring all of the executive orders come uh, May 20th. Um, Karen, that, does that, if, if that in fact happens, does that change your timeline on opening to the public or are you guys just on that track um, by choice? I think that that's really by choice. Um, we'll be looking at any of those restrictions in terms of how we, how we open safely, like in the sanctuary, will we have different spacing or in the commons? But no, I don't think that that will um, impact our, our reopening date decision. Okay, good. Uh, Greg, how's everything going at Glass House? And, and again, with you, with the chain, with the, the uh, you know, the expiration of the orders, how's that gonna affect you guys? So uh, we opened last Thursday for uh, tours. Uh, we are doing outdoor only tours, grounds pass as we call it and people are driving direct to the site. And we've sold tickets through June 30th in that format. So we probably won't alter our, uh, what we're doing before uh, July 1st. And even then uh, we're kind of in a wait and see mode, but we also need clearance from our parent organization in DC. Um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. I mean, you know, what Karen was talking about, how do you do this safely, both for the visitors, but also for our staff and then to the extent that we have buildings with art in it, uh, we need to understand the cleaning protocols and how that might impact uh, both the building and the, and the collection that we have on the property. 
So it's not so straightforward as to say, and also the busing coming from the downtown visitor center. So we're in the process of evaluating it. I, I uh, did see the governor's, uh, uh, well, video of the gover governor's uh, discussion of uh, what, how he sees things evolving. Um, it's great news to hear if we are really in that kind of a position. Um, we also draw from all over. So that, that further complicates it in terms of uh, who's coming from where. Uh, so there's a lot of questions embedded in this, such as, do we have a right, excuse me, do we have a right, do we have an obligation, or are we prohibited from checking on visitor status in terms of vaccination? So those kinds of questions are getting evaluated. Um, we have decided we will not be doing a uh, in-person fundraiser. I mean, we had to make that decision uh, certainly before the governor came out on Monday, um, and we weren't willing to take the risk that we wouldn't be able to get adequate number of people on site to make it economically viable. So May 28th, we're opening a uh, online auction as we did last year, and uh, that will close on two weeks after that on June 12th, which was the date that we would have held the uh, in-person um, gathering. Uh, we are looking at uh, doing several smaller scale uh, gatherings on the property in the fall. Uh, dates not yet determined and, uh, you know, it'll all depend. I mean, once, once these um, regulations or, or guidelines are uh, um, put to the side, what's going to happen with the incidence of infection and, uh, and all. So there, it's, it's not something that we can commit to just because he's said that on May 19th, he's going to relax these standards. Right, okay. Thank you. Nancy, I see you getting a new patio over there. You're muted. You're muted. Nancy, you're muted. I can't hear you. I just was saying, I'll keep talking to myself. I'm like, ah, um, the, the terrace is great. There's been a lot of interest actually in, in various organizations using the terrace and that's why it's there. I mean, we want it to be a community resource. We're also doing the historic trail up at the top of the campus. I mean, our plan is that we're doing a lot of infrastructure improvements where all of the buildings are gonna be painted this summer. Um, the terraces are gonna be finished and then September 18th is our first big event and it's going to be fall back into fall back into history and it's going to be a fundraiser and it's we're going to have food and drinks spread out in all of the buildings all through the campus so it will be probably about 50% outdoors. Um, and then we're ho very hopeful October for design is underway the modern house day tour tickets went on sale and we're about 50% sold out, which is super oh, exciting. Gosh. So early. So I think that people are really eager to come back. Um, we're hopeful. I mean, obviously we're gonna refund the money if, if we have to cancel at the last minute, but we're really hopeful that by October 22nd, 23rd, 24th, which are the three days of the tour, uh, we will be good to go. Um, we had a discussion last night actually about an issue that Greg raised about whether you could require passports. I think you can't legally. Um, you know, but we're just we're just really hopeful. People want to be together, and I'm hopeful that people will then get vaccinated so that it's safer to be that way. Good. Okay. Uh, Laura, what's going on over at the chamber? So I think we're going to get the go ahead to do a sidewalk sale. I think we're going to do it. I have to get approvals from the town, but it looks like we'll do it the weekend of July 17th and possibly do a little mini one at the end of the summer. Um, and I think it'll be not quite as low key as it was last year, but not the full blown circus that we usually do. So that's been keeping us busy. And um, other than that, we just got a couple other little initiatives. I've uh, been talking to the folks about the EV, which is gonna be great, sending an email out, um, but we're excited. And I'm also hoping I can do Taste of the Town Stroll at the end of the summer as well. Uh, and we've got a golf outing on the books, so that's exciting too. So looks like the year is maybe gonna end, the second half of the year is gonna be a little more normal. So we're really happy about that. Good. Um, anybody else? I mean, I, I just, 
called on people that were affiliated with organizations, but I know all of you are busy. Anybody else got anything to add from around the room? I just was Any updates add. from our real estate folks? Yeah. I, I have something, yeah. Uh, we are going to contract on the WAVE building, which is exciting. And the, the pop-up uh, nonprofit will be most likely moving upstairs, which I think has been good to fill that window. And uh, so that's been a very good thing that that building now has rented. That's great news. Mm -hmm. Rock, on the preservation perfect? side, just oh. of what else I do, uh, we did, we did uh, go to contract and we have a closing on a John Black Lee house, uh, which is important because that house could have easily been scraped and it wasn't. We did find someone who wished to purchase it and to preserve it. So okay. just recently I did that house and I did a house in Wilton. So it just adds to our collection of important houses that are saved. Great. Jack, are you at liberty to say which house it was? Yeah, it was uh, on Old Rock Lane. It was uh, a John Black Lee house. And then in Wilton, it was a Charles Forberg house, who was uh, the uh, son-in-law of uh, Gropius before that uh, his that wife married uh, John Johansson. And he designed the uh, Pan Am logo and did the longhouse out in uh, East Hampton. So significant house and uh, just a magnificent home to be saved. That's the one, both of them are, but the one in Wilton, that's what I'm talking about now. Great news. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw uh, at the end of the planning and zoning meeting, so it's public information that it's a salon that's gonna go into the wave space. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's and they right. do a, a specialized service that is quite expensive. And uh, they're very successful in their other location in another part of Connecticut. So it is a very knowledgeable young retailer that did spend time scoping out the town and found the location and kind of, you know, it's a classic, you know, example of somebody uh, coming to town. Uh, but I think that they're gonna be very good and very- That's excellent. Draw That's from excellent all the towns around with their special service. Right. Brock, what are you seeing on real estate side, commercial real estate? Uh, things are starting to perk a little bit, um, pop a little bit. Filled uh, 76 Elm Street, Heather Gaudio is taking uh, space two doors away from her. She had some space across on South Avenue, some uh, extra space, but she's taken what was the Dorothy Mann space so that will be good. Um, it was interesting that Bevel Sadlery building traded again. So we'll have to keep an eye on that and, and what that means, um, whether or not there'll be a financial services firm moving in there or that's just a play to um, assemble the, the abutting sites there for something else. Uh, but hopefully we're slowly starting to come out of things. I think people are still hesitant to take office. People have made their summer plans. So hopefully September, August, September, people start to think about leasing office space again. Can I just ask one other thing, uh, Tucker and Laura? We had talked about maybe uh, honing our statistics a little bit better about the amount of space available. Um, so we can compare. Has any work been done on that? You're muted, Laura. I've got a spreadsheet. At one point, we were talking about trying to put the square footage in there. Right. You know, right now, I have a I have a unit, a unit by unit, um, which I've got to update, um, and I can certainly share with everybody. Uh, and at some point, if we have to see what the town database has, if I could lay square footage in there, which would give us, you know, a, a better feel. Um, but that's about it. We've got about five this or six major sort of uh, data analysis studies going on over at Town Hall right now, or more um, data yeah. collection, if you will. Uh, it all so started really a lot with COVID where we wanted to get all of the um, the transfer station permits online, we're doing parking renewals online. And so we've got a special projects coordinator who's really in charge of a lot of that data. And we've asked him to help us with that piece. 
So as, as TDAC members, can we get a report on that on a monthly basis? If it's available. I mean, yeah. I mean, Laura, you keep track of it on a regular basis. Yeah, it's a very unofficial spreadsheet. And basically it's just what, what we see and what we know. Um, mm -hmm. Like once I hear, like it, you know, if I know the, the, the wave space, the contract's been signed, then I'll say that's not vacant anymore. You know, even if mm -hmm. something is being worked on, if it's being, if it's been claimed. So um, it's a very, you know, just, just a simple Excel spreadsheet. I have municipal buildings in there and then I calculate the, um, uh, the vacancy rate, I take the municipal buildings out um, and, you know, come up with just sort of a rough formula. But we can certainly share what we have. That would be helpful. Okay. You know, the thing, I was walking downtown today and there's one store on Elm that's like the activewear store, Jade Activewear, and there's oh. all this mail piled up in the doorway. Oh, that hasn't been Jade for a while. Yeah, that, so it's not Jade anymore. Uh, this uh, company called Hamptonite, uh, who's been in two other locations on Elm Street, uh, moved in there. It's great stuff. Uh, I mean, I've bought a lot of stuff there, but the, the gentleman, it's a one man operation and he had one woman working there and his wife died. And I think he's having a lot of personal struggles. So I don't know what's going on. Okay. Uh, it's, I think it's one of Hugh's Hughes spaces, but I don't know if it's up for lease. All his inventory is still in there. So I don't know what, but it hasn't been open. I haven't seen it open in months. And they've still got a for sale sign in the window. Yeah, just piggybacking on that, what Nancy just said. Um, and I actually did mention it, the, um, the movie theater exterior to me should be uh, looked at and maybe buffed up a bit. That's in the works. Okay, good. Or not in the works, but it's it, it's on the list. Yes, um, and we can update you on that a little bit. I'm just someone's just telling me that there's no volume on 79. <laughs> this happens every meeting. I have to 79. If you can hear us, um, Jose, we've got no volume apparently. Um, okay, Brock, did, did we did you finish up? I can't remember. I think you I just, did. Okay, anybody else, the rest of you out in the world or you wanna just move on? You know, I just have one thought. Um, we were talking about vaccinations and you know, how yeah, we can't ask people for that. But what if we gave them a, an opportunity to get, I, I think of this because I went to Staples the other day and they're laminating your vaccination card for free. And that's why I went in there because I was doing something else. So, you know, that's a great service. What if we offered that on Elm Street? as something to invite people to come down to Elm Street. And if they do it, maybe they get 10% off to use in one of the stores. I don't know, it, it could be a way to, we know we have somebody who's vaccinated and it, and it brings them down to the street. It could, I don't know if that's of interest, but I thought it was pretty clever for two staples doing that. They're actually now telling you not to, to laminate it because you're gonna have to get a booster. <laughs> Oh, right. really? Okay. Yeah, so they, um, but they do have, um, which a lot of people, um, I ended up getting my second shot at Stanford Hospital. I got my first one in town and they gave me a little plastic sleeve okay. that slides in and out of, and it was actually branded. BJ, you're raising your hand. Uh, yeah, um, at Loop, at our company, um, we've been taking people's uh, card, double printing it, and then laminating and handing it back. So they have the original, but they have the one that's laminated and oh, they can right. know, slip in and have. But to your point, Alan, something about something along those lines. Yeah. Oh, I mean, be such a good idea. There. Yeah. Down there, so just a thought. Okay. Um, we have a couple of people who are going to present some ideas for us tonight. And I see Chris Herring there and Laura, who um, Chris was on the Parking Commission has now moved over to planning and zoning. We will pray for you, Chris. Um, um, but he had done a lot of work on electric vehicle parking um, options and Laura now is part of the Parking Commission. And I think Leo Carl was gonna join us but I don't see him, but um, do you wanna, Chris, just share where you're at with this and what you think the opportunities are for downtown? Yeah, we were, we were actually to... thinking, yeah, Leo, do you have the presentation? I can kind of dig it up. We were thinking Leo, Leo created this awesome presentation and we were expecting him to be here. 
Do you want me to look for it, Chris? Or yeah, I, I have I have the presume, so I can okay. I just need to pull it up. Um, do you want to get the background, Laura? While I yeah, I pull that up? so and we've touched on this before. Uh, Chris and I were on the Parking Commission together uh, for a while. Chris is now over on P and Z, um, but as a concept, you know, increasing our EV charger status in town um, to help literally put us on the map. Um, Chris is an EV driver, um, Keith uh, Richie is also in our little subcommittee and obviously Leo is, um, and we know that a lot of people have range anxiety um, because you know when they travel, they wanna always be able to keep their charge up. Right now we have one spot in Morse Court. We have, uh, uh, Carl Chevrolet has one and Chris, uh, I guess there's one up at country school, but that's probably not publicly uh, accessed. I don't know. Um, they, they may not be on the map. And as a way to make New Canaan more attractive to visitors who were coming to Historical Society, Glass House, Grace Farms, uh, we would love to have more EV chargers in town. There's uh, some starting money in a, in a budget, uh, a municipal budget. So we have some ideas for that, but we wanted to really, Leo Carl, uh, obviously has been way at the forefront of this as a dealer and is very involved nationally uh, with the effort. And he put together some great information uh, just about the it. growth of EV uh, and all that. So Chris, Chris can take, take you through that. Uh, Tucker, can you make Chris a host? Yeah, he should or? be able to share. Okay. He should be able to share, okay. Um, perfect. So everyone see this? Yep. Okay. Let me just move to presenter view. So what Leo, Keith, uh, Laura and I came up with was this presentation. And, and as Laura mentioned, this is very much Leo's work and um, I'm happy to step in for him today. And what we wanted to start with here was a timeline. Leo has been following this very closely, obviously running the, the dealership for years here. And from a timeline perspective, we're absolutely seeing a ramp up um, very much in the, the last year to two and expect to see the, the ramp accelerate. Um, so what this is saying is new vehicle registrations, that doesn't mean vehicles on the road. In the US, 1% uh, were EVs in 2008, 3% um, is the estimate for 2021, and then 15% in 2025. So just in the few short years, four years, they'll go from 3% to 15%. And this is vehicles. This is not cars. So you have to think about the fact that, you know, this isn't including pickup trucks and other things. So taking into account the way the market's committed to producing vehicles, um, we see a, a fairly substantial inflection point coming uh, in 2024. Um, where the market will just um, crest um, as compared to other light duty vehicles. And this is you know, very much focused on Connecticut. So this is not a national trend. This is, um, this is a drill down into Connecticut. So right here in our backyard, what do we expect to see as far as you know, the relative sale of, of new vehicles as compared to, to ICE vehicles? I standing for internal combustion engine. Any questions thus far? Pretty straightforward. So, um, you know, you know, they're the early adopters that jump into EVs because they're cool. They're maybe you know environmentally interesting. They are, you know, maybe the the newest thing on the block. But the real, the pragmatic buyers are looking at cars from a cost perspective and a convenience perspective. So there's, there's a big part of EVs that's entirely dependent on the battery technology for two reasons. One for cost and, and very related for range. Um, so what you'll see here, like you see with a lot of new technologies is, it, is it a logarithmic scale of a decreasing cost for battery technology um, that's happened over the last 10 years. 22% uh, the first couple of years. And in the last couple of years, it's still gone down 20%. Um, 
And this is because of innovations around lithium ion and manufacturing costs. And so, as you might expect, you know, the lower cost batteries, the more compact they are, uh, that means you can put more of them into a car, which means people can go further. So I was just listening to it, a podcast this morning that talked about when early EV cars came out, the range was 74 miles, um, something that was only really good for around town. Now range ranges routinely um, are in the 400 mile range. And so this kind of brings us to, to where we are today with, with New Canaan. Uh, most EVs are charged at home, um, but there's this concept of range anxiety. Um, I'm sure every one of us, if, if you're driving late at night and maybe you're driving you know, through the upstate reaches of New York and you realize that a couple of gas stations are now you know, no longer 24-7 um, and you realize that you may run out of gas because you just don't know where the next gas station is, that is raining, range anxiety, um, plain and simple. But it's accentuated when an you know, electronic vehicle that's typically driven around the neighborhood or driven in to work or back from work, uh, you're going to a destination. So you want to find a destination that will have a place for you to, to recharge your battery um, so that you can safely come home if you hadn't thought to recharge it the night before, prior. So, you know, for example, do you go to a restaurant with an EV or do you go to a restaurant without an EV charger and um, that can potentially drive it, drive where you go. So you know, as Leo points out here, it affects every EV driver and it will drive people away from locations um, that are you know, EV charger deserts, right? So if, if we're driving up from New York as an EV owner and we're looking to go to the glass house or you know, go to the the you know Norwalk Aquarium. If we know that there's an EV charger near the Norwalk Aquarium, you know, maybe the choice is to go there versus versus mm -hmm. the glass house. Um, and so you know, the points are fairly obvious. So these can be eliminated if we provide, or not we, if if there are EV chargers in locations proximate to uh, destinations. And so today we're at a, a one to 15 uh, deficit to, to Darien, um, more like a one to 20 deficit to Westport, um, you know, one to 15 in, in Greenwich. Now, granted, they're closer to 95, um, but that's, that's, some, that's some ratio. And so this is the challenge that we thought as a group, Laura, Keith, um, Leo, and I, is that we felt like New Canaan's you know, perfectly set up to make a small investment to kind of put the last piece in the puzzle for a, a green destination. We've got fantastic public parks. Um, we've got great institutions like the New Canaan Nature Center, the Land Trust, uh, the Green Link that connects these various assets. We've got um, you know, new institutions like the, the Planet New Canaan, and of course, you know, the, the resources on the call today, uh, Grace Farms, New Canaan Historical Society, Glass House, all of these real assets that celebrate, um, you know, being outdoors and celebrate the intersection of, of the built environment with nature. And so today, you know, the, the thing that's incongruous is we just have one charging station at Morris Court. Um, and so they, the stations below the 12 in Westport, those don't count the ones that are on 95, which are the fast chargers. Again, fairly straightforward point. Um, so this is what Laura was referring to in terms of getting New Canaan on the map. It's a great analogy. And I think very, very clear here that there is somewhat of a desert if you I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but if you kind of look at where we are up here at where that corner of Connecticut is, it's quite quite empty of, of chargers. Now it's typical that these fast chargers, which you would use on a long road trip, are going to be along the routes, but the destination chargers, which are what you might find at a hotel or a restaurant, 
where you can maybe get 35 miles an hour versus 200 miles an hour in terms of charging speed is what um, most towns would pursue. And so that kind of leads us to our next point here. This is another charge map. This is what you might pull up on your iPhone or in, in, in my Tesla, for example, it pulls it up on, on my driving map to just show me where the, it'll actually route the, it'll route me based on the chargers on the, on the, on the route. So it's smart enough to know that. So by having more chargers, we effectively will, will rewrite the directions as to how to get to various locations. So let's talk about um, the different types of chargers. I'll try not to get too technical here. They're pretty straightforward. So level one is effectively a, um, an extension cord. So it's 110 out amps, sorry, volts. Um, and that's what you could plug in and you'll probably get uh, one to three miles an hour. And so that would be um, something you would do as kind of a last resort, you know, that plugging into your outdoor outlet. Level two is a dryer outlet. I'm sure many of you, if you have an electric dryer, will have a, a, a 220 outlet behind it in one of those fat um, circular outlets. And that, that ampage, um, usually it's on a 50 amp uh, circuit breaker, that will get you 34 miles an hour. Um, so if you're you know, getting a lunch um, and your car is charged, charging, you, know, you get an hour and a half lunch, you've got 50 miles charged up. Uh, and then there's the, the direct current um, fast charger is what DFC, DFFC stands for. And those are, you know, often called superchargers. So you probably have seen them on the Merritt Parkway in Greenwich. They're the kind of red branded Tesla superchargers. And those will get you somewhere in the range of 300 miles an hour. Um, but from a cost perspective, um, what, um, what Leo's highlighted here is that, you know, the DF DCFF, DCFCs, sorry about that, are have huge capital costs, you know, seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars to install, and um, this is just a lot of infrastructure. Um, the level ones, candidly, are just not that compelling because they don't charge fast enough to make that much of a difference. And the level two is is the sweet spot. So um, the, the charger. What we have, Chris, at Morse Court. Yes, yeah. it is. Okay. Hey, Chris, it's Leo. I'm, I've been on. You've been doing a good job. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, do, do you want to take over, Leo? Uh, I mean, you're um, you're doing a good job it. explaining it. Basically, you hit it on this slide. It has the. Um, uh, it depends on each EV is a little different, but um, the average charge at a level one charger is about four to five miles per hour, five, right. four to five miles of range per hour of charge. Level two is like 25 to 35 miles of charge per hour. Um, and yeah, for, for an area like New Canaan, for um, shopping, restaurants, um, level two is sort of the sweet spot. And uh, I don't know if you touched on this at the beginning, but it's really we're at the point where public charging is not an absolute necessity for most EV drivers. Um, except on the highways for long distance trips, but it is the accessibility of charging, um, as Chris mentioned, eliminates the quote unquote range anxiety that EV drivers can feel from time to time. And it just puts people in a more comfortable zone knowing that there's charging available. Um, the reality is most of our local residents will charge virtually hundred percent of their charging will be done at home overnight. But um, just having visibility of chargers around town will um, put people at ease. Plus, it attracts people who come into town uh, who maybe are dining at a restaurant or shopping in town um, to be able to plug in and charge and get a little bit of range. It, it, it's a welcoming sign. So um, it sort of a, creates a win-win. And that's one of the points of bringing this to the TDAC committee is that, and we'll get to this at the end, 
it's as much a raising awareness that we need to start addressing this. I've, I've been saying we needed to address for a while, but um, we, it's time now to do it because the scales are tipping. And in the next, I predict the next two to three years, you're going to see a, a much larger numbers of plug-in EVs. Um, and some of you on this call will be having one in your driveway that you might not expect yet, but they're coming in large numbers. Virtually every manufacturer is coming out with plug-in EVs and some very big mainstream manufacturers, including GM, have put a stake in the in the, the ground for GM. They've said 2035 is their goal to go um, all EVs. It's not it's not likely going to be 100, percent but it's it's a uh, some countries have outlawed ICE engines or internal combustion engines in Europe beginning in 2030 and 2035. So there's a global move towards electric vehicles. They're just um, they're very fun to drive. They've become um, feasible from a cost standpoint. The cost of batteries continues to drop and will continue to do so, I think. And um, they are here to, to stay. So I'm gonna change the landscape. So you can roll ahead, Chris. And Yeah, Leo, just a quick, quick point yeah. of um, logistics. I used the, the last presentation I had, which was um, oh. prior, prior to your updates. So did you okay. wanna shift? shift to your more current uh, sure i can do that okay. any uh, questions well well basically Leo pulls what i'm out? hearing from you all is that when you look at darian or westport or whatever that it becomes an attraction if you will or a destination uh, especially people that own those cars know which towns have them where they have them and they they tend to frequent those businesses those areas accordingly yes Yes, yes. I think amenity attraction. Um, I mean, just the same that you'd look at having a, a bench on a sidewalk, uh, uh, you know, I mean, and not to oversimplify it, but, um, you know, it's, the, it, it's, it's part of what could tip it in our favor versus going a different destination. You know, Norwalk Mall, for example, in my, you know, has free charging when you go down to the Norwalk Mall and so it, it's just, you know, do you go to the Norwalk Mall or do you go to the Stanford Mall? Well, you know, I could go, instead of going to the, you know, fast charging spot or whatever, I forgot to plug my car in last night, I'll go to Norwalk Mall. And those, you know, those 5%, 10% decisions, you know, it's an extra $200 every visit to New Canaan. I don't know what the, the metric is that, that we've arrived at, but. Chris, do you have a, do you have a, like you said that there was 12 in Darien, 20 in Westport, what have you, do you have a look, you, do you know where they are, like location wise, are they, you know, are they centered in their downtown, are they at their train station, are they, you know, are there areas where we should be focusing on, or, or, um, or where they're focusing on that we should think, think of? <clears throat> Well, Absolutely. we're going to get Tiger. We're yeah, I was going to say, can we? <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry about that. I, I, that's I, okay. I didn't want to get ahead of you. We don't it's have right as question. much. I, I I personally know where a lot of the chargers are. We don't have them mapped out in the other towns, but we're going to get into the um, some of the thoughts behind, um, I think, where New Canaan could be thinking about. So um, if you think about public charging right now, um, it is a potential magnet for current EV drivers. Um, they do, if you talk to anyone who has an EV, they, they look for places they can drive to um, that have charging available. So the vast majority of charging is done at home overnight, but public charging it becomes a, um, a sort of a stamp of approval. So within the next five years, there's gonna be a, a really big shift in the vehicles um, on the road. Um, and I just think New Canaan is set up our quintessential New England town where we have a, a downtown business district that's um, not dissected by a main highway. Um, we're set up to be a very attractive destination. Um, if we embrace this and, and sort of get a little bit of a head start. If you fast forward five years from now, I think any place that has a business district is going to have to have EV charging available if they want to be a viable business district. Um, we're currently in the still in the infant stages where there's a window of opportunity to sort of jump out a little bit ahead and have 
greater visibility than the average municipality. Um, so we have to think about it thoughtfully. Um, and I think it's as much an attraction to potential new residents. I mean, we've, we've had a wave of people coming out of New York City this past year. Um, there's always people looking at the various communities around Fairfield County if they decide this is an area they want to move to. Um, if someone has an EV or is predisposed to get an EV, the availability of public charging is going to be one of the things that they look at um, in terms of making decisions on where they, where they buy. It could be the difference between deciding to buy a home in one town versus another. And um, I think we need to realize that. The, so once, if we admit that EVs are gonna be more part of our daily lives, the next logical question is where do we think about charging? And so um, I've come to think that the most viable places to put EV charging is in higher turnover parking locations. I don't like the idea of supplying an EV charger for someone who's going to park in that space and use it all day, maybe commute to the city. So my thoughts are commuter lots are not, while they're certainly viable options, um, there's less public benefit because it's really only benefiting one person per day and likely the same person multiple days, if not every day, but over the course of a week or a month, it's a race to whoever gets to that spot first. But if you think about the parking lots that see much turnover, morning meetings, noon lunches, afternoon shopping, evening dinners, movies, those spots are logical um, places to try to incorporate more EV charging stations, both from a visibility standpoint and from a user benefit standpoint. So we've got downtown, we've got restaurants, shopping, we've got the Morris Court lot, the Park Street lot, the town hall, lot and the Locust uh, Street lot. There's schools that potentially could be a benefit to teachers or administrators, but then after school activities and weekend activities where you have a lot of people coming in and out of the parking lots. We've got places like Waveney Park, Irwin, the town pool, paddle courts. And again, as a community, if we think about it as we're not necessarily trying to provide um, free charging to the world, but we're trying to make New Canaan an attractive um, destination. Um, there's all, a lot of private business lots around town. Um, and then there's destination sites like the Glass House, Grace Farms, Silver Mine Art Guild, Waveney, the, the library. Um, currently, we have one municipal charger um, at Morris Court. And um, I have three public charging stations at here at Carl Chevrolet that are used a lot of evenings and weekends by all sorts of drivers. These are just a few um, spots around town. This is one of our chargers on the right side of the screen. Um, uh, there's a, this is the old post office parking lot, um, which is now below the railroad station, but there's, there's a power box visible at that station. There's a parking meter here. Um, a, a spot like this is a logical, less expensive, I just took a, a few photos around town, a logical, less expens expensive place to potentially think about um, putting in a charger. Now, um, I'm not advocating necessarily commuter parking, but um, you know the bank is right here. Maybe, maybe we can get some local businesses to, to join in on this idea. Here's another uh, electrical box over at the center school uh, parking lot. Um, here's the back wall facing town hall of the, um, the old Outback, now um, Health and Human Services. Um, anytime you have an existing structure where you could attach charging to a, to a wall that's there, or anytime you have um, an island such as this, where you could put a charger is easier installation, less costly uh, than trying to put a charger in the middle of a, of a full paved parking area. So anytime you already have power going to someplace, you're, you've got a head start. Um, so those Can are just one. A, yep, go ahead, Chris. One, just piling on one point here um, is that 
you know, as, as you saw in one of the earlier slides that Leo put together, the actual charger cost is, you know, 300 to $500 for the one that's mounted on the wall here. Um, so if, if you think about that cost, um, it's not very large. And then the install cost is, is going to, to probably, you know, double or triple that, that circumstance. And so, you know, that's trenching, that's putting in some conduit, that's maybe putting in some bollards to prevent people from running into it during snow removal or, or just bad parking. Yep. Um, so one of the things that we talked to is the idea if, if you have, it's almost as expensive to put in three or four as it would to be to put in one. So what you'll often see in a lot of these locations is a dual or tandem um, charging locations. So you kind of get two for the price of one, so to speak. Yeah, and we also um, we also talked about the fact that the the current single charger that we have at Morris Court is um, it's only one charger there, and um, the reality is that could easily be expanded to two, three, or four. Um, the power is already running there, and um, I took some photos this morning, ironically, and I didn't. I didn't get to add them to this slide, so I apologize. But that was going to be one of the points of this. If if we're going to start someplace as a town, that <clears throat> that's probably the the first no brainer place to um, expand is is the one place we already have <clears throat> one um, one charger visible. There's actually two plate two parking places that are labeled for EVs. They have green stripes and an EV logo on the ground, which was really great. Tiger got that done years ago, but there's only one charge head there. So only one car can charge at a time. Um, we have a problem where people park in those spots that are not in EV cars. Yeah, it's called icing. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, if you go through that lot and it's, it's full, I mean, I think if the spaces are, um, those spaces are tight in that parking lot as it is, but you get, um, you get a car that pulls in there. Um, I've gone over there um, to charge a couple times when I'm, if I'm going to dinner or whatever on that part of town. And I've seen cars parked in there that are not yeah. um, EVs. I've even, I've even found someone with a Ranger over that took the EV charge cord and set it on their windshield underneath their windshield wiper just to pretend <laughs> like they were um uh, we're supposed to be there so you get but oftentimes it really is uh i've parked there many times and gotten a charge i know other ev cars have yeah to me the obvious thing the first thing we should do with any money we have set aside is to spend five thousand dollars and get a charger for the second spot that's already there set aside for ev cars mm. if there's anything we do that should be number one and everything after that is a great idea but yep. let's not forget the obvious. And I'm not even sure, Keith, it would cost five thousand to do that. I think you could probably do you could probably do at least two more uh, for at least two or maybe three for five thousand. So I have room in that. I have room in that electrical box. If we wanted we have, to we have, do, we have room in the in the panel. In the box, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, in the panel, we have extra. But, we have extra room on the panel. So, so that, not was, that was here. I thought was yeah. You know, yeah low hanging fruit. Right? Let me just say further that the advantage of that parking lot is you see it as you come up Main Street, so you can go by and see if the spot is taken. You can see if the charging yeah. is. It is a great one for anyone who's coming for dinner or for shopping in New Canaan. That is the most, uh, the lowest hanging fruit. And in my mind, the first thing we should do. Yep. The other things we're talking about are important because we need to make our community attractive to EV buyers, which is the future. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but let's not forget the low hanging obvious fruit, which is Morse Court. Yeah, so I, I, I would agree, Keith. What do you say to the people who are very protective about uh, limited parking anyway, and um, using choice locations close to town for for the EVs as opposed to what you were saying about destination locations. Well, Amanda, let me, let me say for one, we kind of crossed that bridge in the parking commission when we, you know, we charge for those spots in Morse Court. No one's getting a bargain for parking the EV 
charging spot. You have to pay just like you have to pay in any other spot. Um, okay. So, you know, what, what are we really giving away? I, I agree. I, I'm a little worried about, you know, we're ready to go to three or four spots in the Morse Court lot and give those up. Uh, I'm certainly convinced we ought to do the one additional spot, which we've already had set aside for the, for the last several years. But, but you're right, if we get to where we are really going to set aside 10 different spots, then we have to be really thoughtful about where we put those additional spots so as not to create a parking shortage as we get to more EV cars. But when we get to more EV cars, I tell you, once you have one, you, are, you love to find a spot where you can be charging when you're stopped. You know, Keith, you, we don't, we don't, we don't. You know, it's not EV only. Those spaces at the time yeah. were not, you know, if, if uh, they don't get ticketed, if you're a, you know, if you're an ice well, driver, you don't get ticketed there. We haven't been, but we're, we're trying to get them to start doing it because it, it didn't used to be much of an issue, but now there are, there's enough, there are enough EV cars in New Canaan that that spot is virtually always taken during the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's Amanda, you, it's a good question. And it's a, it's been the philosophical sort of, I've been involved in lots of conversations for the last 10 years. And I guess maybe 10 years ago, it was um, too aggressive to think about putting a lot of charging stations in. But I just can tell you from where I sit um, and what I know about the market and how it's changing rapidly, it's, we, we hit the pause button federally for four years and nothing happened on um, the momentum was stopped that was starting and it's it's accelerating now and it's going to end up in the same place that it was planned to be um by by 2024 2025 and it's it would shock most people to look to know how many different versions of plug-in evs that are about to hit the market in the next 12 months and you'd be surprised around town how many cars there's Porsches I've seen in town, Audis, Mercedes, BMWs that have plugs in them. They're not currently um, parking in a in an EV spot. And I'm not advocating that every spot be an EV, but the more visible EV spots are, um, the more welcoming the town becomes. And I, uh, I guess it's a, which comes first? They're coming. Do you wanna be um, on the map and be considered? Um, uh, and I, I, you, you could talk to Arnold Karp, who just um, has been building the view, and they planned on putting in, I think, four EV chargers in his initial plans for that building. And I think I talked to him. I think they have a, like a dozen chargers that they've ended up putting in so far because the demand has been much higher than he anticipated. What about? That, go ahead. I think the, another compelling point is the number of businesses in town that would benefit from that Morse Court location. I think it's a great idea. And what about a, a public-private partnership, say, um, like Acme's very large parking lot, which is mm -hmm. rarely filled to capacity? Would there any be any impetus for them to contribute? So great. we had an idea there. Go great ahead. Great point. <laughs> um, so if, if you look at this slide, I'm not, we're not advocating that this should be done solely by the municipality or by municipal funding for taxpayers. There's a lot of opportunity for joint projects, for private funding. Um, what we really wanted to do is raise the idea with this committee and try to get your pooled input. But I think there's some, there are some big benefits for business owners in surrounding towns. I've worked with other landlords and business owners who have installed EV chargers as a means to attract new tenants or new businesses. Um, I know of a lot of private EV chargers that are available to um, patrons of different businesses in the area. Um, so that's an option. What the town might consider doing, maybe there's a way to grant some sort of um, tax, property tax credit to any business owner property owner who's installs EV charging as a, as a means to incentivize it. Doesn't have to be huge, but that was a thought. Um, there's some lists of things on here. Um, seeking the input of private um, developers, um, potential collaborative 
things with local green organization or environmental organizations. There might be some grants available. Um, so who's taking the lead on, on following up on all of this is my question, because they're all good ideas. Is it just you, sm your small little group there? Or? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, you know, we, we, I, you know, my, my attitude is that, you know, I think, I think we can, we can tackle this task by task, but, you know, I think we, we'd want to have a coordinated effort, you know, backed by, backed by this, you know, backed by people that, that would, that would have our back, so to speak. Right. You know, I, I think like for, you know, for example, we said, you know, we'll pick Walgreens, you know, Walgreens will give you a, a, a $2,000 one time, you know, property tax grant if you install two chargers. And, mm -hmm. you know, Centella Electric has promised to install them for half price as long as they can put a Centella Electric, you know, sign on them for two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you get is a, a 4,000 install at $2,000 and a $2,000 equipment charge. And so your net cost of Walgreens is 2000 and, you know, so that, but that would, that would require, you know, the board of finances agreement, you know, Centella's agreement. And it, I mean, my hesitation is I wouldn't want to go off hot, half cocked without, you know, kind of buy-in from, from Tiger on the logistics and, you know, Kevin yeah, on. on I, the, I think this is definitely something that should be pursued. I mean, I see it where I spent a lot of time in Vermont, there's a, a local restaurant there that has three of them and people go there, deliberately go to eat there because they know they can charge, yeah. them. hear it all the time. So there's, um, a, through this slide in here, just as um, thought this is more for P and Z, but the state of Connecticut has, this is under consideration, I don't believe it's passed in Hartford, but the state has a state building code and there's a proposal to um, set a requirement for a number of level two um, chargers per so many parking places in new developments. So I, this is just something that could be um, built into codes. We've had in town here, we've had the, um, you know, inside the magic circle, there's a supposed requirement or offset parking offset, but there's a contribution that's gotta be made. Um, if a developer can't put EV charging on the site they're developing, maybe there could be a fund that could um, help provide funds to put a charger in a municipal parking spot as, a, as an offset if they're not able to do it privately. I'm not big on, on adding more regulations, but I think this is, this is sort of just raising the awareness and raising the collective community, um, I guess, awareness on how we might address this together. Um, I don't think, to Tucker's point, I don't think it's any one person or any small group that's going to be able to do this. I think we have to um, get support from a number of places, um, town hall, you know, public works, but also from potentially from PNZ, potentially from um, through the Chamber of Commerce, or raising this with some businesses. We could we could put. You know, any of us would be happy to put together a similar presentation, maybe for landowners in the commercial business district, the benefits of doing this, but it would really help if we had, as part of that pitch, some sort of property tax credit from the town that was available for the first, you know, year or two years to get this um, effort going. Um, and I don't think, again, I don't think it has to be a lot of money, but... Um, a th you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars per charger would be um, probably enough to move the needle a little bit. There's a chance the state could come out with some um, incentives as well. I don't know of any on the horizon, but um, there have been in the past. A couple times there's been incentives for charging stations. Um, so this is just. Yeah, this is, it's, does anybody have any questions? Anybody else on the committee have any questions or comments? I had one question. Um, in a typical home, what is the charger amount, that number two area? Level two charger for most, um, most people put in their homes. And um, the, the charger itself is typically three to $400. And the installation depends on where 
the installation is in relation to your um, circuit panel, but usually it's two to four hundred to five hundred dollars of install. There's a small permit fee they have to get. Um, so most homeowners can install a charger for less than a thousand dollars. That's been a small barrier for some people. So I know in the in the case of Chevrolet, starting this summer with the um, new Bolt and Bolt SUV that's coming out, they're going to include home installation of um, a level two charger as part of the that comes with the vehicle. Um, and I've I've hooked up Santella Electric and a couple other electricians in local towns to be the local installers for those. So. Um, well, I think if there's, you know, for starters, hopefully, um, I think Grace is on the call or, or listening that, you know, she'll write something up. Uh, this presentation is compelling. Um, Laura, maybe it should be something that, you know, you could send out to, um, to the downtown list. And I, I like the idea of possibly making sure that the building department sees it. I mean, those numbers really speak for themselves and to encourage anybody who's doing any development like this to include one for sure. I mean, that, that's, that's the easy part um and I think then fire, also, many opportunities for any others i think what do we need uh, oh sorry amanda what do we need to do to can we make a recommendation to board of selectmen that we would like to get that second charger installed and at least spend the money that's that's on the that's in the budget right now uh to show that the municipality is leading the way because with that kind of wind behind our back, we can go to the uh, some of the private property owners. I, I've even, Chris and Tiger and I had a conversation with Brock, you know, about his parking lot and just in general talking about it, but to say, hey, we, you know, the municipalities behind this, you should consider it too, um, to kind of get, to get a feedback. Tiger, you, the 10, you have $10,000, you say, Tiger? Yeah, I have $10,000 in capital that's okay. been carried over. <clears throat> so my, my thought was uh, the low hanging fruit of Morse court. And then Leo, the picture that Leo had on the town hall annex, which was the furthest space to the left. If you're looking at the annex, which is basically towards the walkway, uh, was a nice location as well. Mm -hmm. Especially since it's mounted on the wall and I can, the mechanical room for the annex is in essence, right behind that space. You know, it's not a far run to get to the electrical boxes there. So those are my first thoughts you know, initially, yeah. Um, and then from there you can go forward. If you want to go up to Park Street, uh, we had a thought up there and elsewhere, but those those two, the Morse Court one is easy. I've got room in the box and string another one out, not a lot of money. So what do you need from us to start those projects, Tiger? Or, little, or from the town? Tucker, I, thought, I thought we agreed that this is really a parking commission better. Right, but I mean, I think what they're looking for is support from TDAC if we think that this is something that the Parking Commission, Tiger and others should pursue. Yeah, I'm all for this effort. TDEC is trying to focus on what we can do to help downtown. This would be a great initiative. And I think we should be all for it, um, starting with expanding at Morse Court and um, build, build from there. I also think TDEC is perfectly positioned to um, highlight this from a a public relations standpoint that our town is forward thinking and, and we care about sustainability. And, and as you said, um, Keith, having it present, something you pass by and see, I think sends a great message. Yeah, thank you. So, so Keith, I think if, if your group, want, if the Parking Commission wants to make a recommendation, um, to move this forward makes perfect sense. Yeah, we have a meeting coming up in uh, about two weeks and uh, we'll do that. Okay. We had, and Laura, you know, Laura's been leading the charge for the parking commission and uh, Chris was before he left and moved on to PNZ. <laughs> That's a good place to have him though. We need, we need all the good people there we can uh, get. Nothing happens over at PNZ, snooze. No, right? <laughs> yeah, you got nothing going on. Fluff job. <laughs> Um, thank you. I, we have other things on our agenda, yep. so I think I'm going to wrap this one up. Um, great. I will just leave you with one thought. If anyone on here thinks that there's another audience in town, because I think a lot of this is just building grassroots um, sort of knowledge and support. So if there's any other groups that you think would benefit from information like this, we can tailor it to whatever audience there is, but happy to uh, 
happy to do that. I think so. you should do a podcast maybe on New Canaan. <laughs> I could talk to him. Yeah. It's sort yeah. of interesting too, because the New Canaan Nature Center is looking at doing that renovation and they're really looking at sustainability mm. and maybe sort of oh. something interesting for them is, is they're looking at that pilot to um, add another level of um, environmental. Good idea, Karen. Yeah, someone should yeah. reach out to Bill Flynn as they're yeah. moving that it's, project forward. Yeah, it's the time to do it is when you're doing a renovation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. When everything's up, but he, he, he may be interested. And Leo, and between you and Tiger, you guys probably have some preferred suppliers for for, for all these, you know, devices that, you know, uh, that'll be good to know too. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to stick around. Um, Tiger's going to give us a, a brief update on um, some modifications that are being proposed for Elm Street. He can really explain it better than I, so I'll turn it over to Tiger. Okay. Can I? Uh, can I share? Yep. 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 You, you have the okay. ability. Yep. So, this is a presentation that we gave to the police commission uh, last night, um, and what we are looking at is some uh, pedestrian improvements in and around the center of downtown specifically the intersection of South Avenue and Elm Street and uh, the crosswalk at Elm Street uh, from say Dunkin Donuts to the Playhouse. So if you look at this uh, aerial itself in the bottom right hand corner we have South Avenue that enters um, here the mobile station is a little bit lower and then Morse Court is off to the right and then you come in out to Elm Street and Elm Street's running uh, left to right or right to left I should say in our, in our, in our picture here. Uh, and then this crosswalk here is from the Dunkin' Donuts Plaza uh, across to the Playhouse. So as you can see, the existing striping layout that we have um, was created to uh, comply with state law uh, as far as keeping 25 feet away from a crosswalk um, based upon uh, for pedestrian safety itself. So if you look here, we have a 25 foot distance, 25 foot distance. This, this portion of the block gets rendered um, unusable and then the exact same thing happens. And what we're finding is uh, we're getting a lot of people abusing the privilege and parking in this area here specifically to run into Dunkin Donuts. And now we've put in fence posts with chain link, you know, with little yellow chains to try to prevent it. And it's not necessarily the best look and it's uh, kind of self-defeating because while we're trying to do this to increase pedestrian safety, when people abuse the privilege, they actually decrease the pedestrian safety um, and make it worse than it is originally. So <clears throat> while we've been looking at this for a number of years and we were looking at what we call pedestrian bump outs, um, the Western Council of Governments, Westcog, uh, came forward and looked at a, um, a study that we did, a joint study between uh, New Canaan and Darien as far as increasing pedestrian safety, but more, more uh, focused on a bike loop between Darien and New Canaan. So we could come from the New Canaan downtown to the Darien downtown, encompass Waveney, encompass a little bit of uh, work out, uh, kind of a bike route outside of town and outside of Darien. And part of that study, they came back with this plan, which is something that we have been looking at, where again, this is South Avenue coming in and Elm Street running from top to bottom now and there are bump outs on all three corners or four corners of it. Um, so if we jump forward to what we did this past summer due to COVID, um, kind of took that a step further and we put in uh, barricades across the entire area. They actually extend through this location as well, down to Rosie's and on the other side of the street in front of Dolce, we have uh, some a, a different type of barricade, but nonetheless, we've blocked it off um, so we kind of looked at the fact that while this was successful and it proved that we not, might not necessarily need all the parking that we had, uh, what could we do to increase the pedestrian safety and then possibly regain some of those spaces? So we came up with this plan, um, which encompasses what Westcog was thinking about, what we had been thinking about prior, and then um, utilizing the spaces. And then because of it, we're able to get back um, some of the spaces that we lost due to, uh, due to the 25 foot rule 
on either side of the uh, on either side of the crosswalk. Because once you put it in a hardscape situation, um, the car can't necessarily strike a pedestrian because the hardscape's in the way. So that 25 foot distance reduces down to a more of a 20 foot distance for sight distances. Um, and it gives you a little bit more utilization of space. So if we look at the exact same layout that we had, where we're looking at a South Avenue coming in here to Elm Street, we'd be looking at a small bump out on the Southeast corner, a little larger one on the Southwest corner. And then we would have a continuous bump out where we have the barricades now, um, continuing from uh, Northern side of the street, just, uh, just east of the crosswalk, extending all the way up to the Playhouse lot or the Playhouse um, Plaza itself. Um, and then on the opposite side of the street, on the Dunkin' Donuts side, we have a small bump out on one side and then a larger one on the opposite side. Um, and what this does in effect is, uh, again, it protects the pedestrians, gives us a little bit more um, open space and a little bit more pedestrian uh, space for our downtown, gives it a little bit more of a village feel, um, and then gets rid of uh, the people that would be abusing the privilege, so to speak. You know, the area here in front of Dunkin' Donuts where the accessible space is, everyone's parking next to it. So the accessible space in effect mm -hmm is uh, null and void because you can't necessarily um, use the space because you can't get out of your vehicle, right? If you have a wheelchair or what have you, or, or a, a ramp that comes out of your van, so to speak, you can't necessarily get out because somebody's parked in the hash mark next to you. May I ask a question? Sure. Is there a curb with the exception of the ramped area so that the cars don't feel that difference? Let me, uh, let me zoom in a little bit here um, and I'll explain exactly what it uh what it looks like or how it looks and feels um so if we kind of get in into it a little deeper um let's go over to south avenue so in essence you can see the gray line all the way around the gray line is a granite curb we already have granite curbs on the edge of the road um up and down elm street with a brick scape with a brick sidewalk we'd be looking at doing the exact same thing so this entire area would be at the the height of the existing sidewalk, so six inches above the grade of the road, that's a standard, it's a six inch step, uh, all the way around to the opposite side and it would be brick infilled. And the area here and here would be ramped down for uh, curb ramp for uh, accessibility issues. The exact same thing happens on the other side, this entire area gets granite all the way across and then a brick infill. We would keep the existing granite curb because it would give us a delineation plus we have all of our utilities for the lampposts are stored directly behind the granite curb. The moment we pull that off, it starts to get a little bit of mayhem behind it. We feel that it's just easier constructability wise to build straight off of it. So in essence, this would be a six inch high curb as it is now all the way across um, to the, play, uh, the playhouse. And then on this side of the street, it's a little bit different only because we have an accessible space here and we don't want um, disabled individual individual with needs to have to walk out into the roadway to come around. So this one island is flush. And what, so while it'll have granite curbing all the way around to delineate it and a brick infill, it will be flush. So if you get out of your car and into your um, the area of accommodation, you can then come straight across this area and come up the, cur the existing curb ramp while this side will be raised. So it's the only place where we actually have it flush, but given the fact that the differentiation materials, we feel that we won't get that as, as much use of the area. And then what this allows us to do on an overall basis, if you look at the yellow numbers and the gray numbers, you can see what exactly happens. So the yellow would be what's the proposed number of parking spaces and the gray is what is present um, pre-COVID because right now we have no parking on this side because of the barricades. But pre-COVID, we had five spaces in this block here. You can almost count the cars. Um, this one is not supposed to be here. It's actually in a no parking area. And we would be rendered with zero. So we'd be at a minus five. But if we go across the street onto the southern side of the street, we actually used to have eight. We get back to 11. And on the opposite side, on the opposite block, we had 17. We'll get to 20, possibly 20, 19, 20. We are looking at uh, potentially hashing this area out 
for snow storage and uh, um, for snow melt. Our, our fear is that this will get, uh, while snow melts in here, it'll become an icing condition. We will be upgrading the drainage in all the areas to try to accommodate for that. But we were looking at certain areas for snow storage, given the fact that the gentleman plow all the way down, there's instead of piling it on top of here, we pile it here. And then the next day, um, usually we come in and remove it next day or day and a half afterwards, we remove it. But in essence, that kind of gives you a, an overall feel as to what it'll look like and feel like. Uh, we still have to tweak the sketch a little bit to make sure that the turning radii works for all vehicles that would be using it. School buses, fire truck, um, larger vehicles, things of that nature. But uh, we feel that it'll be a nice, uh, it'll give us a traffic calming effect and then it'll increase the pedestrian safety, get rid of the scoff laws and um, and then give it a much more downtown village feel. Uh, if you have and, any... and not with, with no loss of parking spaces. With no loss of parking, actually, yeah, net. Um, right. uh, it, I mean, yeah. Well, actually, we right now, we right now we're at those spots we're, being 15 yes. minutes. Sorry, tomorrow, oh, I didn't get to that, sorry. Yeah, That's right good. now we're at a minus five because right. of the barricades, right? So in essence, we'd be gaining back the five. You know, pre-COVID, it would be a net zero during COVID, it would be a positive five. Um, and then to give you an idea of when we met with uh, some of the restaurant owners and some other uh, concerned citizens, we, we came up with the idea, this gives you an overall view um, of the entire block, so to speak. Um, we were looking at adding these red dots are 15 minute spaces. So two just to the east of the South Avenue entrance two in front of Dunkin' Donuts, and then two mid-block between the crosswalk at uh, the Playhouse Dunkin' Donuts and Park Street, so another two here. So that would hopefully help us with uh, turnover, people coming in to pick up uh, uh, takeout, or if you've already ordered something uh, you know, from a store and you need to run in and get it and come back out again, you can necessarily jump in and out. We feel that that will actually help a little bit on turnover and help with uh, uh, allowing people to find uh, parking when they need it for the short term. Um, in, in case any of you were gonna ask, I'm sure somebody's thinking about the fact that, well, what are the delivery trucks gonna do now that the, that uh, parallel parking is taken away over there? But the fact of the matter is even today, they don't park up against the curb. Um, they do double park along the side of the road. I mean, the, the right. parking the commission, yeah, we've been trying for a long time to find better loading zone areas for the trucks. It's funny though, once someone said that um, it actually does provide a bit of a traffic calming effect. I know Kevin also is wants to think about possibly changing the speed of uh, Elm Street. I think it's 25 miles an hour, which is way too fast. for mm -hmm. a street it's, 20, yeah, it's, it's 25 now, but it's not posted. And, right. uh, and then so when we had the traffic uh, engineer look at it, Michael Galante, and he came out and said that the 85th percentile is 15 miles per hour or less. Right. That at that point in time, you're probably better served to not even sign it, just to leave it as is, mm -hmm. uh, because we're already seeing the effect uh, and not sign it. With the effect. Right. Uh, that's his preliminary view, but. Um, but we, and the 15 the minutes were definitely something that. Um, so so you also should know that. Laura and I and, and uh, others and, and Tiger and others hosted a uh, Zoom session with a lot of the downtown businesses just to get their opinion. And we, we sent the link out to others. And the 15 minutes are definitely, 15 minute spots are definitely something that many of them had asked for, have been asking for, for a while. Um, so we think that that um, solves that problem to some extent. So anybody- Can I just ask, can I just ask one question? Um, those spaces, Tiger, that you're creating have a raised curb. Can they be public space? Can you put park benches there or is that just? Oh, yes, we, uh, we will be looking at, they, we don't want them to be void. Um, so uh, they could be for planters. You could put in um, seating, either benches or say, uh, you know, um, knee walls, so to speak or mm -hmm. other amenities absolutely a bike rack the uh, one of the one of the thoughts was to oh, that would be great place, place a bike rack on the on the island itself on one of the islands but we don't want them to be void spaces that are void at that at that point the uh the restaurants themselves you know once uh 
once the COVID rules kind of drop, they could necessarily put their um, uh, their tables and chairs out on the bump out and then allow the pedestrian straight through, right? So straight through access, which is actually mm -hmm. preferred. Um, it's not to not to divert the pedestrian, but to actually put the uh, put the uh, outdoor dining on opposite aisles and have the aisle straight in the middle be for pedestrians itself. So it would be a uh, it could be utilized for that as well. Yeah, because those spaces are relatively large and they could be mm -hmm. almost like a vest pocket park. Yes, and, uh, and it would be very powerful for the restaurants if they could somehow use some of that space. That'd be great. And also for beautification. I mean, I, I think of pretty planters. Yeah. Every, you know, again, we want to keep everything low. The whole point is to keep the sight lines mm -hmm. clear, um, but you could really do some some nice things there. Now, this does present a problem for our snowplow crew. Uh, they got to come through now and be a little more careful, but they're aware of the plan and um, figure they can work around it. Right. They're, yeah, not completely happy. <laughs> is there any thought of, um, is this all funded by the town? I just... It seems to me that the town's bent over backwards to um, do everything they can to address this section of town. Uh, is there a public space rental possibility? The restaurants get a benefit from the town spending money. Um, the town's you're really focused on improving this area of town. There's certainly other areas of the CBD that would love would like the same love as well. Um, I can't answer that other specifically other than saying this really all began um, when we needed to um, adhere to this public the part of the safety issue of, of intersections. Um, Fair enough. And, and so that was just that was something obviously safety is paramount. And when we were seeing what was going on, especially in front of Dunkin Donuts, uh, if this works, uh, I certainly could see us trying it in other places um, or maybe even extending it. Um, but I think these two spots make sense for us to give it a try. Greenwich is doing a similar thing. Uh, so I think if it works, Brock, to your point, uh, we could implement it other places. We have property in a city where the tenant has to pay a public space rental bill uh, to rent the area of the sidewalk for their, you know, for their restaurant tables and chairs to be set they, up. They do so. pay a, a, a fee now to, well, we've, we've, uh, we're, we're not requiring that during COVID, but there is a fee for them to get their uh, cafe permit in normal times. That's an, that's an interesting concept because, you know, Chef Louie on one end and Rosie and um, Patisserie on the other end are going to be, up, you know, at some point upset when the sidewalk goes back to normal and you know they're going to wish this was in front of their their location mm -hmm. and maybe that's a way to make it fair fairer all right um can i, I just mention one other thing as a long-range sure. thought um you know other towns have wider sidewalks than, than we do generally and I didn't know whether at some point we should be looking at the width of our sidewalks as we build new buildings. I know most of the town is built out, but uh, especially the way we seem to be changing our culture, uh, sidewalk, uh, the depth of the, a deeper depth of sidewalk could be beneficial. I, I would agree with you, uh, Jack. It's, um, we try where we're putting them in elsewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a five foot minimum for us, which is, uh, it's a four foot, the, the rules right now used to be a three and a half foot. Now it's a four foot minimum, mm -hmm. five foot recommended, six foot preferred, but you, mm -hmm. six foot is very difficult to get and a limited right away. So we've mm -hmm. been working with a five foot um, because two people walking abreast is about four foot, eight inches wide, mm -hmm. 4.8, 4.9. Um, so we've been trying to stay at that five foot marker. Um, mm -hmm. but you are right. Some of the areas we have just the right away is, is a little limited, but this I think that this look here gives us a mm -hmm. nice insight into it. And then if it if it if it's successful and people like it and take to it, then yes, we would be looking to trying to do that um, elsewhere. But I think that's a nice idea. Yeah, I know how valuable you know the, the, the land is to, to people who own it and want to develop it. 
but I because I actually thought the amount of sidewalk width at that building on the corner of Locust and Forest is challenging. You know what you're saying; it's very narrow. Right, and it, it would be beneficial if it was wider in my mind. Yeah, we we did look at that there, and it, it the uh, it, the right away that we had was limited. Um, where you know the space that we had between it and we uh, it and right now it's maximized mm -hmm. um but yeah we are we are trying to see what we can do in, in every yeah. location um but I, I i would agree with you and the Thank timeline you. on this tiger is you're thinking about uh late summer we're hoping yeah we uh we we met with the police commission as i mentioned last night they would like to do a walkthrough um to see it uh and the, the the nice part is that right now we've got barricades running this entire length here so they can actually see exactly how much space uh, of the roadway would be taken up because it's already taken up with the barricades and then the other areas here and here we already have uh the posts and chains as i mentioned so we're hoping that we'll meet with them within the next couple of weeks go back to them uh for their next meeting uh gain approval and then at that point in time um, we're still tweaking the design. We're going to run the, the turning radio, as I mentioned, in, in the interim between the two. And I'll, hopefully they say yes. We'll go out to bid and uh, we'll look for a late August, September build uh, given Board of Selectmen approval. I think it's a beautiful solution that, and net net with no spaces lost, it's a real. Um, you know, improvement to the town and um, slowing traffic will be an added benefit. Just seems like a, a great solution. Thank you. It really does help the businesses. I really think so. So, all right. Thanks, Tiger. I'm going to move us right along here. I promised um, everyone we'd stop at nine, but thank you very much. And okay, um, Trump. I don't think there's anything else for me. Is there? No, I think you did great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. Laura and Amanda and BJ, you want to take us through the storefront art where we're at? Sure. Um, I'm going to be a share the sharer, and Amanda, you'll be um, just kind of talking about what we're up to. Sure. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. So uh, I noticed that Dan wasn't on the call tonight. Um, I know. We're sad about that. Yeah, he's such a great contributor of uh, being able to pro provide this art. And so this is really a group effort that was initiated by Dan and BJ through Dan's acquisition of these drawings that many of you have seen um, that um, are of some of the remarkable um, buildings in our New Canaan midst and um, we wanted to round out the selection with um, some other um, contributions. So um, Mark Markavitz, who should get a big round of applause, um, mm -hmm. has over the last week filled in some of the images that we didn't have. Um, uh, this this was one that he had previously done that Nancy Geary had of the uh, Rogers studio. And he also um, newly generated, well, he actually took this image of Grace Farms and he added people to it. <laughs> um, and um, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, all of the images have a, a very short description. Um, uh, so that the idea is that on the empty storefronts, people passing by could learn something about the town um, and obviously enjoy, enjoy the images. They are of two artists' hands, but um, we felt with the drawing style that they, they held together nicely. Um, so Mark um, um, modified this one slightly, I think, Grace Farms mm -hmm. is happy with it. And also um, the glass house was one that he had previously done. I don't mm -hmm. know if it got in here, but the, he also- The glass house is here, but the I think that the writing is not appropriate. Okay. Writing. Yeah. Um, and he actually generated this image just within the last couple of days for us 
of the Elliot Noyce house from a oh, Michael, Bion Michael Biondo um, photo. So all of the institutions, um, Nancy, I know you'll have to double check the text, uh, make sure it's appropriate for you. Yes, but, yes. Um, I think all of the institutions have checked their text. I think Grace Farms wants to probably double check it one more time, but just to make sure they're happy with what's being said. And um, Nancy, why don't you tell about the production and how, how it works? Well, I mean, BJ. Yes, and um, what's exciting about this is that these are done in panels. So a uh, landlord can come to us and say, okay, you know, we have a certain width and these are done in such a way that the height is fixed, but the width can be changed. So we can be flexible depending on which landlord and what window um, and be able to accommodate it. It's a very, um, it's a nice weight paper in that it's not too thin and it has a good drape. So we're excited about um, being able to do a quick install every time somebody wants to use something like this. And then, you know, it's cost effective. It's not um, too expensive to be able to go this direction. Um, we just had the an excellent opportunity to also get a beautiful pen and ink drawing of the um, carriage house, um, which we're over, overjoyed about and hope to connect with her to get her copy. The carriage barn, yeah. Yeah, yeah carriage barn. We're just so happy about that. So yeah, everyone's um, made a big contribution. And, and the overlay of the auto cast, you can see in the lower left-hand corner near where it says for lease, there's the little QR code. Mm -hmm. um, so, to the extent that that's an, uh, a developing idea, there's the opportunity to actually link with that for the, the buildings mm -hmm. that are destination appropriate. Um, so, but we did find that having some text there, so if you didn't know to use the QR code or that hadn't emerged yet as a possibility, that it could be something that we um, generate as, as, it, as we go along. And we wanted to be flexible because, you know, some landlords are not as sophisticated as, you know, the ones that are on this uh, Zoom call. Um, you know, they might want it to the, you know, one QR code that talks about the entire space. And then we want an autocast QR code that would talk about the actual image. So we just see that as a great technology that could, you know, take us a little bit further than um, you know, just a typical uh, white paper going up. So we're excited about that. Um, so what, it's all would it be one image? Um, if I owned um, a storefront, uh, the, the old Irresistibles that's now empty, and I came to you and I asked for this, um, would I have one image on the paper or would, would there be multiple images? Um, just one image. And it would, um, well, you know, if Irresistibles is two windows, then there's a potential of having two images. So it's per window. Okay. Yeah. And um, we took a walkabout, um, Laura took a walkabout and was able to identify some kind of key width sizes. And we know that that height size will stay the same. There you get the continuity, which is just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're, you know, using um, uh, illustrations from artists from town here, it's kind of exciting to think that this could expand as we move along to um, other fantastic, you know, locations. And we need to make sure we credit the artists on, on here yes. somehow. Yes, definitely. That, that's a missing yeah. piece. <laughs> Very good, sir. And will you just do it in rotation? I mean, will it be like vacancy one gets Grace Farms, vacancy two gets glass house, and then you start again when they need a new board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Correct. the that's the hope. We we want to be able to be able to kind of run through all of the um, illustrations. So, um, you know, just in the last two or three weeks, we got kind of blessed with these beautiful illustrations of um, Grace Farms and the noise and um, glass house. So we're kind of excited that people are interested in being able to provide illustrations. So 
I yeah, and BJ, you know, you said expansion. I mean, I had mentioned this that I, I would think it'd be important to include Vine Cottage and the 1913 library. Mm -hmm. And I think the Vine Cottage um, did come up. Uh, what's funny is we have to find the illustrators. So, doesn't uh, Markowitz have a, uh, an illustration of that? I think that was in yeah, his shop. He does. That was on display at the uh, Gore's Pavilion when he had a show there two years yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, we were, I, there's, we there's were slightly focused. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see this. And listen, we, we don't want a lot of empty storefronts and that we have to use this paper everywhere, but <laughs> there's there's certainly um, other buildings, I mean, that could be considered. Uh, I, I love it. I, I I love these this last version that came through. I think they're exactly what we were trying to achieve. And, and I love the the ones that Dan supplied too. So um, what do we have to do uh, next, Laura? You and I still have to follow up with our one sponsor who might help us with some of the funding on this. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, BJ's team has a budget which includes, there's kind of a per panel uh, based on the uh, horizontal dimensions and that includes uh, the, the um, the uh, installation, mm -hmm. yeah. So I it's think- like a one with, package deal. Right, I, I think the grant from the one landlord will help cover all the kind of setup charge that's going on and getting mm -hmm. them ready. And then um, possibly, you know, if we could request the board of selectmen, uh, well, this group has to decide uh, if we can vote uh, to use some of the funds we have left remaining for this fiscal year to put aside for printing uh, up some of these. Um, and, and then we'll go to the landlords. W once we uh, have, you know, we kind of know what the drawings are, we know the funding source, then we can go to the landlords and ask for permission. How much longer do you think it's gonna take, Laura? Uh, I, I mean, we're ready to, to go. The printing's all been set up. It's just, you know, it's really releasing the funds. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, Amanda and I are working on the last bits of details on the copy and being able to get the autocast QR codes. And so we're mm -hmm. close. Um, there are areas here that once the landlord says, oh, we'd like one, we need to do the for lease, the phone number and their right. QR code. So there's just little details like that, but that doesn't take long. So we need to Good. find a Good. landlord or two to, to help us get this going in terms of offering up a window. Uh, we mm -hmm. need to finalize um, the, the, the donor that Laura and I had talked to. Um, mm -hmm. And then we just need to uh, get a couple of them up. And if, it, if people seem to respond and, and we like it, we need to get some funding for more. So you would any TDAC them? money go towards it? Yes, that's the, that's the goal is the TDAC would help pay for some of the printing in the pilot of this. So we mm -hmm. don't have to try to get money from, from all the landlords. What we'd like to do is use the TDAC money if possible to offer up um, these for free. And then we would have to work on getting access and um, Susan on BJ's team uh, would, would hang them up. You know, it might be that um if you have a really receptive landlord um, to almost get, get a couple of them up right away and to use that as a marketing tool to go to other landlords, see if they, yeah. you know, wouldn't you like one of those too? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the landlords should take on the cost of this, not TDAC. I mean, they, they that's, all, that's all I need to say. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean they created their problems, they, you know, Thank they, you, they should, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean. No, but that's good, that's good. Especially, I mean, if we get, as I say, if we if we can secure this one sponsor to help us with all of these initial costs and that kind of thing. I love the integration of the AutoCast. Um, I think that's yeah. really the nice feature as well. Um, and certainly if there's some gaps, you know, we could maybe ask the Board of Selectmen to, help with some of that on the funding. But I, I do tend to agree with you, Brock, that uh, what would be the individual cost if someone came, BJ, and said, you know, once we've got it set up and ready to go and, and I need two for my windows, let's use the irresistible space again. What, what would a, uh, a landlord be looking at in the way of cost on that? 
Yeah, I um, I want to say that they were about 300 per. I'm just going yeah, into that. Uh, uh, up and down from 300, uh, depending on the horizontal that dimension. That horizontal dimension. Okay. Yeah, and that's installed, which is great. Somebody did ask me whether or not they could be installed and then repurposed. And, you know, even though it's a, um, it's a paper vinyl, it's like a combination, mm -hmm. you know, you have high hopes about that, but you don't know what the environment would be within. Well, they're also, the they're also customized with the broker name. Yeah, and all phone this number down at them. the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all customized. One of the things, if we have a, a, a row of empty storefronts, really um, hanging them at a certain level off of the uh, sidewalk will be important. So it really looks like a white band going down the sidewalk with images yeah. along it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and one of the, the one of the landlords we've been in touch with is, is he owns a lot of those buildings that are empty or those storefronts that are empty on Main Street. So I think getting the getting them up there uh, right some of his, uh, are, are the worst offenders, uh, and you know we can have all the different images going there. I, I think mm -hmm. that'll draw a lot of attention and give us the opportunity to knock on the door of the other landlords, mm -hmm. talk to their property managers. Yeah. So, Laura, do you think the participation will be high? Do you, no. I, I have no idea. Uh, you know, know, some of them may say, "I don't want to spend." 300 or if I've got, you know, mm -hmm. some, some of the stores like Papyrus have uh, windows on Morse Court and on Elm Street. And, yeah. you know, going to a landlord right now saying, okay, I want 600 bucks. They may say, well, I don't care. That's, you know, the but having I, the landlords pay for it is I think the right thing to do, but it will absolutely slow up the process. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly should prioritize if someone has a, a front and a back um, a storefront, the Elm Street and Main Street, because that's where people are mostly walking. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a great program. Jack, do you, I know you've seen this in other places, Jack, and was this along the lines of what you had in mind? Yeah, and, and one thing I have noticed in some other places, there's 100% compliance. They may have this in code, in their codes to make this happen. <laughs> so- um, yeah, We talked about that at one point. Could we yeah. require this to some extent? Yeah. So to, to have it successful, I mean, I don't, we have to look at look at that. Uh -huh. so. um, I, I'm uh, pleasantly excited. I would hope excited. more people would do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the number of, artists that have stepped forward and actually wanted to be part of this. Yes. So that's been very exciting for us. Well, and, and you know, there are gonna be, I mean, a lot of our buildings are owned by uh, more than, but uh, one owner owns more than one building. So if he's got multiple spaces, he, she's got multiple spaces that are empty and one fills up, that's, that panel could be moved to another store. Mm -hmm. Providing the window dimensions are somewhat right. aligned. Okay. Good. Thank so you. So to, to move it forward, we're going to, Laura and I have got to secure this funding. Um, we've got to find a landlord or two who's going to, and it could be the same person who's going to take us up on this for starters. Mm -hmm. and at the very least, Laura, I think we've got to get an email out to all of the landlords who do have the empty storefront saying that this is going to be available. You know, would they be willing to, uh, to absorb the cost? And, and So we don't want to put any TDAC money toward this. Um, I, I mean, I, first of all, I think we've got, hmm, I've lost track. I think we've got three or 4,000, I think, left of what was earmarked for this year. Um, I certainly don't have a problem with it going, just to get it going, to, to make a request, to get the project going. And I think it might take off. And I, I think we could justify that. Unless anybody else has any thoughts? I would go for that. Yeah. I mean, the area that needs the most help right now, I think, is that Main Street section. And I think you're right. It will have a big impact if it fits. Mm -hmm. um, also South Avenue. Mm -hmm. South There's Avenue. a spring there, you know. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll, um, I know we'll that work on this offline to see what, what we can yeah. come together in the way of funds on our own. And... Um,
And I know Amanda and I are just going to keep working on making sure all the copy is great. Um, and then if the auto cast can be incorporated at a certain point, you know, just discussing that. Okay. Laura, you, you give me a rough, tomorrow. rough number of windows that um, are in vacant places right now? I'm hmm. trying to think, uh, Susan, uh, from New Renew, New Renew and I walked around. I mean, we're talking uh, a couple of those spaces have been filled down on Forest Street. I mean, we're talking about at least 10 or 10 windows. Yeah, I think it was like 10 to 15. 12, right, exactly. Yeah, the two Forest Street, what we've heard, the two down on Forest uh, have been rented. So the pet value and the... Um... Yeah, the uh, Green and Tonic is supposedly moving to where Embody was. And there's another pet store supposedly moving in where Pet Value was. That's, we've heard rumor, so I don't know. Well, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. In terms of removing so would... this incentive, I'd like to suggest that we should cover it with TDAC if we can. And um, the store owner isn't necessarily the person that benefits from this improvement in the view. In other words, the rest of the community does benefit from it. Okay. I would at least propose that for this kind of trial run or the, the, the landlord one or two that um, we can use TDAC money to, to push it off. And then um, if we see some interest in it, maybe, maybe that's when we Ask owners. So, so does somebody want to make a motion that we um, recommend up to uh, twenty five hundred dollars um, from the board of selectmen to to approve up to twenty five hundred dollars, depending on what our final costs are, to get this program launched. I don't move. Greg, I like that. Laura, second. Second it. Everybody else, how do you feel? In favor? Opposed? Okay. Good. Thank you guys. I know that's been a lot of work and I know it came together and um, I keep thinking about our downtown and I and I back to sort of our area of focus this going forward. I, obviously COVID, COVID was here, COVID is still here, but um, we really do need to focus on the downtown now. I think we've done so many great things from the cultural perspective. I think the downtown needs all the attention, as much, as much attention as we can get. We do have some small things happening. Clean Your Mile is happening this weekend. One of the things, Dan couldn't make it tonight, but he asked me to share with you, and he said this before, but um, he would love to see you know, a real effort around shining up downtown, if you will. You've heard him say this before. I mean, a real uh, every store owner really cleans up around their space and plantings and things like that. So um, it, it sounds so simple, but it's really more of a grassroots effort in getting a lot of people involved and making it happen. Um, we, we, this group isn't gonna be able to solve the empty storefront problem that we have, but we certainly can make the most of what we do have and, and we can leverage all of that. And that's something that I think we, we have such a beautiful town. One of the things that he talked about a while ago is you know even wrapping the lampposts in some even if it's fake with some nice flower or something. I don't want to compete with the hanging baskets, but something to just beautify the downtown. So he's going to give that some more thought and um, see if he can pull together a group to really work on that. And I, I will ask Tiger tomorrow if we've got anything in the way of sort of power washing equipment to really give everything a good scrub from the sidewalks out to the streets and that kind of thing. And the flags will be going up too, so. The flags will be going up. Um, the barricades that are up now, um, you know, will probably stay up even after the um, executive orders expire, just because it has created such a bonus for our restaurants and for our businesses, all of our businesses. Um, last year, there were just simple flower pots on the top of those, but it really did. By the end of the summer, it was all draping over and, and it looked nice. So, um, uh the theater, I just wanted to bring you up to speed. Maybe you've heard this already in some of our, uh, the Board of Selectmen meetings and others, but um, we are still talking to um, potential operators for the theater. You'll notice that the Board of Selectmen has approved um, the roof project that needs to get done at the theater. That's happening. There's some code compliance uh, improvements that need to happen on the inside. 
Uh, so we're working, Kevin and I are working with a couple of other people in town hall to get that all together. I and mean, we'd love to think that we could get that theater uh, open um, in the fall and we're working hard to do that. But I think um, the operator that we're talking to the most, um, uh, the one that seems to have the most interest right now, it would just be a, a great thing. First run movies and more. And I think it would really add to um, the downtown. So I just wanted to keep you up to speed on that. Tucker, when the uh, sidewalks are bumped out in front of the Playhouse, since that's not a restaurant region, is there any opportunity we have to, um, like Tiger was talking about, the planters or some benches to, to, to really make that a, a little resting spot? Yeah, I mean, if there are two benches there now, actually in front of the theater, and they're used all the time. Um, so the one is in front of um, Earth Garden and the other one is the other side of the theater. So Lay has really had the benefit of moving, you know, sort of all the way down that part of the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. um, they, they've gotten really lucky on that front. Um, so I think you're right. I think once these bump outs are in place, you know, we could, we could do things like that for sure. Um, I don't really have anything more other than, you know, I'm now one of the jobs and in, in one of the responsibilities in the job that I have is to manage all the special events that happen in and around town. And obviously it was very quiet for the past year with COVID, but everybody's getting the word that COVID might be behind us and that we can have more outdoor events because the, the special events applications are coming in fast and furious, which is great. I feel really good about October for design. I think that's going to come together really nicely. I mean, that's so exciting, Nancy, that you're 50% on your on your your tour. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, so, uh, I think I think Dan's on to something with the the downtown and sprucing it up. And I think we'll 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 get some groups together. There's a lot of kids groups that need our slobs, NCL, that kind of thing. Um, that's it for me that I have right now. Does anybody else have anything that they want to add or? Dr. Yeah. Let me just, uh, let me just thank everybody. You know, I, I, I attend when I can to listen and when I miss the meeting, I can go back and watch the uh, replay. So I want to thank you all for your time. This committee is really, really useful to us. And, uh, and I'm very pleased with that. Um, we're making the progress that we are. So thank you all. And, uh, it's great, great work, BJ. Yes. Yeah, and others. We've been uh, Amanda. Amanda, all of you, and we, and and, uh, and Kevin. I don't know how many nights this this is for you this week. I don't know how your eyes are. Still <laughs> I, I'm having a hard time staying awake here. We were late actually, last night. Actually, that's another important thing. You know, we're we're probably going to go back to in person meetings, but um, the value of the of the the hybrid meeting is to have, especially for someone like Tiger who lives an hour away. Um, uh, when we to, to be able to have hybrid meetings where you know a committee commission board can meet and as many who want to come can and those who don't want to come can do, join by zoom so we're looking to uh, figure out how to do that you know for, again primarily for the comedians for our staff that we really don't want to have them stay till nine o'clock at night for meetings uh, if we can avoid it and uh, so i think you know zoom has <laughs> has become part of life under with covid but it really has benefits long term too mm -hmm. and nancy once you get that patio done let's uh let Terrace. Invite us all over and we'll have a, we'll have a little TDAC uh, cocktail over there. You'll have to get in line. I think there's like uh, no. groups that want it already. <laughs> all right. Who would have thought, right? A simple terrace. Are Best problem ever. Are you charging, Nancy? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, all we need is a certificate of insurance. That's it. <laughs> right. All right, I'm going to ask for a motion at 8.57 to adjourn, and we will see you. Our next meeting is May 20th, and we'll have more to report. Uh, Rachel, I mean, uh, Rachel, Laura's giving us a motion. Amanda, second. You guys are all good. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Matt. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you.